personally, and this is just a stab in the dark, I think Manning Clark was taking way too much cold Dane. Here's another of his well-juiced creations. This the merest fragment of much longer of a much longer passage discussing discussing Kelly's legacy. He lived on as a man who had confronted the bourgeois calm down with the with all the uproar of a magnificent Dionysian frenzy, a man who had taken down the mighty from their seat and driven the rich empty away. He lived on as a man who had savaged policemen in the old convict tradition and denounced the brutal barbarism of those who closed their sadism toward the common people in the panoply, panoply of the law. About 2800 milligrams talking there, I would say. Today, Glen Rowan is a one street town with a couple of pubs, a scattering of houses, and a short strip of enterprises dedicated to extracting a little cash from the Kelly legend. On this hot summer's day, there were perhaps a dozen visitors in town, including Alan, Carmel, and me. The biggest of the commercial establishments, a place called Ned Kelly's Last Stand, was covered in painted signs of a semi-professional quality. This is not a place for wimps said one promisingly. Another added, it is absolutely absurd that after allowing yourself 10 to 20 minutes to take photos, walk up and down the street and buy some souvenirs, you then have the audacity to tell your friends, don't go to Glen Rowan, for there is nothing to see. To be quite honest, most visitors to Glen Rowan wouldn't know if the country shithouse fell on them. The impression one derived from father's study was that it contained some kind of animatronic show. Alan, Kamel and I exchanged happy looks and knew that this was a place for us. Inside, a friendly man presided over a cash register. We were mildly staggered to see that they wanted 15 Australian dollars ahead for admission. It's good, is it? Said Howe. Mister, said the man with the greatest sincerity. It's like Disneyland in there. We bought tickets and shuffled through a door into a dim room where the spectacle was to begin. The space was designed to look like an old saloon. In the middle were benches for the audience. Before us, in a deep gloom, we could just make out the shapes of furniture and seated dummies. After a few minutes, the lights dimmed altogether. There was a sudden, very loud bang of gunfire, and the performance began. Well, call me a wimp, drop a brick shit house on me, but I can honestly say that I had I have never seen anything so wonderfully, so delightfully, so monumentally bad as Ned Kelly's last stand. It was so bad it was worth every penny. Actually, it was so bad it was worth more than we paid. For the next 35 minutes, we proceeded through a series of rooms where we watched homemade dummies, each with a frozen smile and a mop of hair that brought
out to mind wind blown pubes reenacting various scenes from the famous Kelly shootout in a random and deliriously incoherent way. Occasionally one of them would turn a stiff head or jerk up a forearm to fire a pistol, though not necessarily in sync with the narrative. Meanwhile, around each room, lots of other mechanical events were taking place. Empty chairs rocked, cupboard doors mysteriously opened and shut, player pianos played, a figure of a boy on a tra trapeze, and why not, swung back and forth amid the rafters. Do you know these, those fairground stalls where you fire a rifle at assorted targets to make an outhouse door swing open or a stuffed chicken fall over? Well, this reminded me of that, only much worse. The narrative, insofar as it could be heard about the competing noises, made no sense at all. When at last we were liberated into the sunshine, we were so delighted that we considered going in again, but 45 Australian dollars is a lot of money after all, and we feared that with repeated exposure it might begin to make some sense. So instead, we went and looked at a giant fiberglass Ned Kelly that stood outside one of the souvenir shops. It wasn't as big or as intimidating as the big lobster and its testicles didn't swing in the breeze, but it was still a game stab at the, at the journey. Then we had a look around a couple of the shops and bought some postcards and returned to the car for the next part of our day's adventure. <clears throat> this was to see the famous Kelly tree at the remote spot called Stringbark Creek. This involved a long drive into a strange, spooky valley of an abundant and semi-abundant farms, nearly all of them half buried under blackberry brambles, then up into dense and verdant rainforest, and finally into crowded groves of towering stringy bark, stringy bark trees. Australia has some 700 varieties of eucalyptus trees, and they have the most wonderfully expressive names, Kakadu Wooly Bud, Bastard Hollow wood, Jimpy Messmate, Candle Bark, Ghost Gum, but the stringy bark was the first that I could identify by sight. The bark peels off in long strips and hangs from the branches in fibrous tassels or lies in curled heaps on the ground, all the better to burn apparently. It was a handsome tree, too, tall, straight, and very close growing. Some miles into the woods, we came to a parking area beside a sign announcing the Kelly tree. We were the only visitors. It felt as if we might have been the only visitors in years. The forest was cool and noiseless, and with all the strands of bark hanging down, it had a strange, unwelcoming, otherworldly feel. The Kelly tree stood along a path through the woods, distinguished from the others by the stoutness of its trunk and by a metal plaque in the shape of Kelly's famous helmet. And what is the Kelly tree exactly? I asked. Well, Alan said with a learned air, as the Kelly gang got more and more notorious, the police started hunting them with great
greater determination, and so they had a hideout in increasingly remote and desperate places, such as here. He gave a nod of assent. Can't get much lonelier than this. We took a moment to consider our surroundings because of the thickness with which the stringy box grew beside each other. There was almost no space to stretch out or move about around, and the air had a kind of dank, organic closeness. It was, I think, the least bucolic forest I have ever seen in, I have ever been in. Even the light seemed stale. For three years, Kelly and his gang laid low, but in 1878, four policemen trapped them here. Somehow, Kelly and his men captured and disarmed the policemen. Then they murdered three of them in a slow and pretty horrible way. Horrible in what way? I asked, ever alert for the morbid detail. Shot them in the balls and let them bleed to death to, maximum, to maximize the pain and indignity. And the fourth policeman, Scarpard, he hid overnight in a wombat's burrow and the next day he made his way back to civilization and raised the alarm. So it was the murder of three men here that led eventually to the shootout at Glen Rowan, as so memorably depicted for us by the robotic wonders of Ned Kelly's last stand. So how come you know so much about all this? He looked at me with a hint of disappointment, because I know a great deal about many things, Bryson. You haven't got the clue about hats, though, said Carmen cheerfully. He looked at her and decided that this was a comment not to be dignified with a response, then turned back to me. Now to Powers Lookout, he announced with a certain resolve and set off in a stately tramp for the car. And how many more Kelly sites will we, will we be visiting, I called, trying not to betray too much alarm as I followed him through the woods. I wish no disrespect to Australia's most treasured thug or to imply any disappointment at all in the Kelly tree. Quite the reverse, but we did seem to be hours from anywhere and fast approaching that time of day when one begins to think about the convivial possibilities of food and drink. Just one more and it's on the way home and you won't regret it. And then we'll have a pint. He was as good as his word. Power's lookout was fabulous. A platform of rock Hanging high in the sky, it was named for Harry Powers, another storied bush ranger who sometimes shared the view with Kelly and his gang. Some diligent crew had built sturdy wooden walkways up and around the craggy rocks, making it a simple, if slightly taxing, matter to get from the main body of the cliff to the rocky outcrop that was the lookout. The view was sensational. Perhaps a thousand feet below spread the King Valley, a snug and tidy realm of small farms and white farm houses. Beyond, across air of flawless clarity, rose waves of low mountains Culminate, culminating in the distinctive hump of Mount Buffalo some 50 kilometers away. You know, if you put this in Virginia or Vermont, I mused, there will be scores of people here even at this hour. 
there'd be souvenir souvenir stands and probably an IMAX screen and an adventure park. How nodded. I'd be this it'd be the same in the blue mountains. It's like I've been telling you. This corner of Victoria is a great secret. Don't put it in your book. Certainly not, I replied sincerely. And what to what what will what will you see what I've got for you tomorrow? And wait till you see what we've got for you tomorrow. It's even better. Not possible, I said. No, it is. It's even better. What he had for us the next day was a place called Alpine National Park, and in fact, it was even better. Covering 2,500 square miles of eastern Victoria, it was lofty, grand, cool, and green. If ever there was a portion of Australia remote from all the cliched images of red soil and baking sun, this was it. They even skied here. They even skied here in winter. Alpine is perhaps a somewhat ambitious town. You will find no craggy matterhorns here. The Australian Alps have a gentler profile, more like the Appalachians of America or the Scottish Kyr Kyrn Gorms, but they do attain entirely respectable heights. Kosciusko, the tallest, tops out at something over 7,000 feet. How, through one of his contacts, had gotten hold of a friendly and helpful warden named Ron Riley, who had a agreed to show us around his airy domain. A genial man with a dapper grey beard, Ron had the lean bearing and far-off gaze of someone whose world is the out-of-doors. We met in the little town of Mount Beauty where we decanted into one of the park's four-wheel drive vehicles and set off on a long, twisting drive up Mount Bogon, Victoria's highest peak at 6,500 feet, about the same height as Mount Washington in New Hampshire. I asked him if Mount Bogon was named for the famous Bogon Moth, which erupt in vast, flattery multitudes every spring and a day, for a day or two seem to be everywhere, along with plump, witchety, witchety grubs and long, slimy mangrove worms. They are the delicacies of the aboriginal diet, most often noted by chroniclers. Noted because, of course, they are so unappealing to the Western palate. The bogongs are roasted in hot ashes and eaten whole, or so I heard read. Wrong acknowledged that this was where they came from, and the Aborigines, Aborigines really eat them? Oh yeah, well, traditionally anyway. A bogon moth is 85% fat, and they didn't get a lot of fat in their diet, so it was quite a treat for them. They used to come from miles. Have you ever eaten one? Once, he said, and once was enough, he smiled. What did it taste like? He thought for a moment, like a moth. I grinned. I read that it has a kind of buttery taste. He thought about that. No, it has a moth taste. We climbed up a step steep winding road 
through dense groves of an amazingly tall and beautiful tree. Ron told me they were mountain ashes. I made an appropriately appreciative face. I didn't know you had ashes here. We don't. They are eucalypt eucalypts. I looked again, surprised. Everything else about it, its long, straight body, its height, its lushness, was completely at odds with the skeletal gums associated with the lowlands. It really was true that eucalypts have filled every ecological niche in Australia. There never was a more various tree. Tallest tree in the world after the California redwoods, Ron added with a nod at the ashes, causing me to make another appreciative face. How tall do they grow? Up to 300 feet. They average about 200. 300 feet is about the height of a 25-story building. Big trees. Do you get many bushfires? Ron gave a regretful nod. Sometimes we lost 500,000 hectares in this part of the Great Dividing Range in 1985. Gosh, I said, though the figure meant little to me. Later I looked in a book and discovered that 500,000 hectares is equivalent to the area covered by Yosemite, Grand Teton, Zion, Teton, Zion, and Redwood National Parks. In other words, it was a natural disaster on a scale almost inconceivable in other countries. I also looked in the New York Times index to see what coverage it had given. None. Even without being able to conceive quite what 500 hectares is, I knew of course that it was a lot, so I added politely. That must have been awful. Ron nodded again. Yeah, it was a bit, he said. We passed through a zone of snow gums, yet another niche dominated by the versatile, eucalyp versatile eucalypts and emerged into a sunny world of high, gently undulant plains covered everywhere in pale grass and spongy alpine plants with long views to distant summits. Quite a few visitors were evident, most of them with a springy step and considered a parallel of the serious walker. At every group we passed, Ron slowed with the window down and said good day and asked if they had everything they needed in the way of information. They always did, but it seemed an unusually welcoming gesture. And then we had the most marvelous day. Sometimes we stopped and walked a little, and the rest of the time we drove. The weather was gorgeous, cool at these heights but sunny, and Ron was droll and good-natured. Good -natured. He knew every leaf and bud and insect, and seemed genuinely to enjoy showing off all the secret corners of the park. We bumped along overgrown tracks through meadowy vales and skittered up near near perpendicular, perpendicular gravel roads to hidden fire towers. At every turn there was a point of interest or a memorable view. Alpine National Park is immense, about three times the size of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in America, but it is actually vaster still because it is contiguous along its eastern border with an even larger 
Kosciusko National Park in the Snowy Mountains, just over the border in New South Wales. Ron pointed out Kosciusko, Kosi, he called it, almost exactly a hundred kilometers away, but I couldn't see it even with binoculars. We finished the day at an imposing eminence called Mount Mackay, where there were yet more top-of-the-world views, range upon range of steep hills rolling away to a far-off horizon. He took in the view with the assessing gaze of someone watching for a telltale plume of smoke. So how much of all this are you responsible for? I asked. A hundred thousand hectares, he replied. Lots of ground, I said, thinking of the responsibility. Yeah, he replied, squinting thoughtfully at the vista before us. I'm very lucky.